team here and we talk about all the aspects of digital intervention, not only in our fight against COVID-19, but also how it can change the life for all of us in the post-COVID-19 scenario as well. So today we will talk about building digital talent pool. Now, the concept here is something which was been indicated by the Prime Minister himself as well just a few days ago when he exhorted the youth of the nation to go ahead and make much more use of digital technology to skill themselves accordingly. And as experts suggest, there is a, a, you know, a very uh, a likelihood of uh, digital technology playing a very important role in the job market, in the work culture, which is likely to see a huge change in the post-COVID-19 scenario. So how can we go ahead and build a digital talent pool? For more on this, we're joined by a distinguished panel of guests today, and all of them are joining through the technological means. We are on uh, the video conferencing platform Skype. All of them are joining us uh, on the same platform. Let me first introduce uh, these guests to you, beginning with uh, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar Panda. He is the Secretary of uh, MSME Ministry, and he's also a part of uh, uh, one of the empowered groups which has been created to tackle COVID-19 crisis about uh, augmenting human resource uh, and capacity building as well. Then we also have with us uh, Dr. Unnat uh, Pandit with us. He's uh, the uh, program director of uh, Atal Innovation Mission. And we have with us uh, Mr. Amit Agarwal, the CEO of Future Skills in NASCOM, the industry representation. So let me begin with the show and let me begin with you, Dr. Panda, to try and understand as to what all have we learned in our journey so far, around five to six weeks in our fight against COVID-19, vis-a-vis use of digital technologies in capacity augmentation and human resource uh, uh, you know, uh, building? Yeah, thanks for having me in the show. Uh, a, a couple of points which almost everybody knows, and that would perhaps uh, put things in the right perspective. As we all know, in this uh, fight against COVID-19, the first thing that we keep hearing from everyone on every platform is that you know we have to maintain social distancing. So that obviously uh, kind of prevents many of the gatherings and the usual the platforms in which you know training is given to imparted to people in a in a gathering. So that's that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second is that you know so that makes us compels us to kind of train our people to build their capacity through technological means through through various. Uh, you know, digital platforms, that's number one. So when government uh, constituted 11 empowered groups, and uh, I happen to chair just one of them, uh, augmenting uh, human resources and their capacity building, mm -hmm. obviously the first challenge or the first mandate or the first challenge was that where are these human resources? What mm -hmm. kind of human resources are required? We don't just require doctors, nurses, paramedics, you know, even dentists or pharmacists or even Irish doctors, we also require a lot of other people who play a very, very important role. Uh, for example, volunteers, mm -hmm. you know, so that you know they can their services can be taken while fighting COVID-19. So the challenge before the group was that how quickly we can actually put a portal in which all these human resources can be put together, their details, their contacts, the state coordinators, the district coordinators, so that the district administration, the municipal administration can get in touch with them quickly and they can start mobilizing those resources. Mm -hmm. One important thing in this particular fight is uh, that we do not know where and how and when it is going to erupt. You know, it's going to come up. So obviously we also kept that in mind and we thought our portal would actually give a, a big leverage. I mean, it will... Uh, the, the all the districts, the state governments can use this to mobilize human resources from one mm -hmm. place to another, to one site, from one district to another, from one <clears throat> town to another. That's one. Secondly, coming back to, uh, you know, just identifying human resources is not enough. We have to also skill them. So that is why government operationalized a specific platform within very, very short time, uh, which is called IGOT, you know, I-G-O-T, Dot .gov.in. Dot so mm -hmm. this is the platform in which, you know, there are many, many kinds of courses which are not just meant for doctors or paramedics or nurses. They are also meant for other volunteers. For example, in our, in our uh, covidwarriors.gov.in, this is the website of our dashboard or the portal in mm -hmm. which we have actually, uh, the group has, has kind of compiled and has put up you know, the details of 
1.24 crore, 1 crore 24 lakh, you know, human resources, including doctors, nurses, and you name name them up to ASHA workers, Anganwadi workers, and panchayat secretaries, and all that details. Okay. Now the point is, you know, how how do we how do we how do we train them? How do we train them in 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 quarantine management? In, uh, in various things that they can be used. In fact, they are also being used. Now we have got NYK's volunteers, NSS volunteers, ex-servicemen, NCC, and then you name it. I mean, those those details are there. So, so I got is a platform in which you know all the training modules, the details are there, so that it is an anytime on-site delivery of training material. Okay. The videos, the training material can actually go to any device. It can be a smartphone, it can be a, a, a tablet, or a, I mean, or it can be just a, you know, a, a, a kind of even a desktop also. So anybody at any point of time can access those training schedules, even at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the night, uh, whenever one, uh, you know, the volunteers come back uh, home and they can be also trained. I mean, that, that's, that's the thing which has been done. Okay, so so this is a, a, a very a, a important aspect, uh, and then both sides being taken care of there in terms of ensuring that the human resources are there, and in terms of ensuring that they are trained well as well in this fight against COVID nineteen. But taking it a bit further, and what we are looking at right now in terms of how to scale it further in the post COVID nineteen scenario as well. Let me bring in Mr. Agarwal here, Mr. Agarwal. One of the studies, or one of the reports, which was done by NASCOM few months ago, almost a year, uh, pointed out that the requirement of digitally skilled professionals will be almost 30% more by 2022. And mind you, this was before we had COVID crisis. Now, obviously, this number would be exponentially uh, increased. So how do we look at this scenario right now from here onwards? We obviously are going to win this fight, but once this is done and over with, the digital technology, all of us know, will play a very important role. How do you see the scenario, market job scenario, the work culture scenario, vis-a-vis -vis use of digital technology? Sure. So the first sort of big change that we are seeing happening is that given the need for social distancing is going to continue for a while. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how long that is. So when an individual company needs to sell something, right? Earlier, a lot of digital marketing was happening to make people aware of what is happening. But now if somebody has to buy, they are more likely to buy digitally. Mm -hmm. Just because of this whole confusion on can I go to into a shop? If I go in, am I safe, etc.? When you buy something digitally now, all of our sellers, the smaller companies, etc., they have to first train their workforce and prepare themselves to sell digitally. Mm -hmm. so, so the very simple, basic thing that I believe can make a massive difference to our country is just this simple thing of training everybody on digital marketing to be able to leverage all the e-commerce sites that are there, etc., to be able to get their product out into the market that someone can buy it. Mm -hmm. That's the first big change that we see. The second one that we are seeing, which may be more longer term, is many companies have already become what we call digital first, meaning many of their process is digital. Human behavior still was mostly physical world. Right? You and I would prefer to interact physically. The change we are seeing is that human behavior may also, depending on how long this takes to sort itself out, mm -hmm. become primarily digital first, certainly in the more developed parts of the world and in India, because it's more easy to do that. If human behavior becomes more digital first, every business, so if you take just the order to cash process, somebody places a demand for a good or service, somebody has to produce it, before that they have to purchase it. Mm -hmm. If you take companies that are selling today, that we just talked about the point that it will become automated and the sale will be done through a computer. But all the way back, if they have to run in an uninterrupted way, they will have to put IT systems on every single piece going back. Because anytime there is a manual interface, there is a chance if something goes wrong, their supply chain will break and they will not be able to sell. Okay. So the humans that are part of those processes, right? all of us that go into jobs, etc., we will have to learn some of those skills, whether we are in finance, whether we are in HR, whether we are in the technology field, whether we are in the manufacturing field. 
all of us will have to learn in addition to our domain little more of the technology piece to be able to work more effectively and i will make one last piece and that's the whole piece on trust mm -hmm. and the importance of professional skill suddenly if we are not all meeting face to face certainly in our it you know in any b2b industry like it it gets that much more difficult to make and build trust with your customer so even if you think of education even if you think of skilling all the ecosystem that is now trying to train people will require learners whoever wants to learn just like the secretary mentioned there is so much good content that they are putting out there for paramedics paramedics nurses to get trained but it requires more discretion from the person who is getting trained to want to be trained because you can't monitor every single thing and therefore our abilities over time to drive motivation of people to continuously learn and get certified will become very important over a period of time so these are three big changes that i see happening okay dr pandit your views on this specifically when we look at uh, you know what changes we might see because as mr agarwal is pointing out behavioral changes will obviously push this through but then there is a question of training trust and ensuring that skilling is taken care of not only in those specific areas which are the focal point right now in the fight against covid-19 but overall in other aspects as well in other industries as well see in my opinion uh see post covid scenario uh, entire industry is going to have a shift in their strategy so uh, in my opinion industry 4.0 will create one digital vertical where in every industry not only the healthcare not only any any uh, e-commerce platform each and every industry will be required to adapt the digital business and digital marketing mm -hmm. and we need to more go on the information data which is getting generated and uh, by maintaining the social distancing they will be in need of a data scientist who can analyze their profiles they will be in need of a ux ui designer which is user friendly and the customer uh, 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 interface is better than the previous one Mm -hmm. they will be in need of a new opportunities for the networking so mm -hmm. traditional networking system will have a entire vertical shift what i foresee uh, take one example of edutech mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, covid scenario edutech app and online education has taken a, a huge opportunity and space into the education sector since last 6 years there were 4500 startups on edutech okay but they were uh, following the traditional western model so that's why they they got some clients attracted uh, and they have sold their erps and all but india needs the domestic need fulfilling edutech startups mm -hmm. our edutech market by 2021 which is in the current financial year is going to reach 1.96 billion which is the can research report is saying okay. just two weeks back whereas china has a 88 billion us dollar market because they are developing the uh, uh, erps they are developing the edutech solution which is according to the domestic need Mm -hmm. they are designing a customized solution say as a one to one uh, teaching to the students and the teacher english tutorials again we are our uh, rural population and the tier two tier three city population the students are facing a problem with the language mm -hmm. but we don't have a customized platform okay so, so we are not serving what our indian society is in need and mm -hmm. i think there is a huge opportunity post covid in the sector of a digital skilling digital platform and digital startups dr panda here dr panda edutech fintech b2b services all these obviously understandable will have a lot of digital uh, use of digital technology but let's not forget that the msme sector the one which you are handling in the government of india right now is a very crucial and a very important part of india's economy as well now the msme sector also 
as our panelists are pointing out, will definitely have a lot of influence of use of digital technology out there. So is there any thought out plan right now? Or is there something which the government is working on, which is already in place, which can be then further scaled up when we are done with this particular fight and, uh, you know, COVID-19 is out? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, let me let me tell you that uh, the MSME ministry, uh, you know, we have had 18 technology centers, tool rooms and technology development centers, you know, for a long time. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And uh, 15 are uh, actually are are are, uh, are are being established now as we speak. Some of them have already started uh, functioning, and uh, now government has approved 120 more such centers, 20 mm -hmm. very large large technology centers, and 100 uh, small centers for better technological outreach. Mm -hmm. Now in these centers. We are now, uh, even before COVID-19, we were factoring in the requirement to have a better technological outreach for the people in the, in the entire you know, length and breadth of the country, where MSMEs and others can actually can, can, can come and the technology centers can use the frontier uh, you know, technology like, like artificial intelligence and you know, virtual reality and augmented reality and things like that, mm -hmm. and the robotics and the IoT and machine learning to, to, to not only just to train them, but to also make them more, more efficient, more productive. So when we were doing that already, there is a very large number of MSMEs and people are being trained. This, this training is already going on. Okay. I mean, but that training actually would also cover the digital part. There would be other training, for example, in, in, in various mechanical tools and all that, that, that will be hands-on training. But gradually, I can tell you, in the months and years to come, I completely agree with uh, uh, our fellow pan uh, panelists that these people in the MSME sector and all other sectors, you know, they are going to come up with very, very innovative solutions technological solutions so that once there is a digital talent pool, how to update their technological you know, capability, prowess or whatever. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think the various startups and the various companies, they are also going to train their own people, their own workers, their own employees, so that you know, they can be, they can be trained, they can work from home. So this is going to go up because things are not going to be the same, uh, the pre-COVID uh, scenario. And I can see a huge competition, just like, you know, there's a huge competition going on now to come up with the first medicine or the first vaccine for mm -hmm. COVID-19. I guess there would be very, very huge competition amongst everybody, right? Uh, across the world mm -hmm. to come up with this more and more, these digital tools, Mr. Agarwal here. Mr. Agarwal, if we look at what needs to be done. Now, since in the past 15 uh, odd minutes, we've spoken about how the scenario will change. And all of us know that need right now or the focus right now is on the training part, on the skilling part, because that is what is required. How do you suggest from an industry perspective, we can move ahead with that? Government has its own plans. Dr. Panda pointed it out in terms of MSME ministry and so what has been done in terms of capacity augmentation during COVID-19 crisis will obviously be scaled up further by the other ministries as well. But from an industry perspective, what is it that needs, that needs to be done? Sure. So I would highlight a few very critical things. So if I take the industry, the industry's current workers, and then it is building our pipeline, which is the colleges, mm -hmm. right, and the ITIs, etc. So let me start with the college ecosystem. So MHRD, okay. as you know, has already launched the NEET. It's a it's a very interesting portal where they're getting many different online providers mm -hmm. to be able to provide courses. The challenge in our higher education system that we have to solve is that teachers and faculty have to be comfortable working on what we call blended learning. Mm -hmm. so there's a huge set of recommendations we're in fact doing with Niti Aayog in terms of how to make blended learning a way of life in a college. So just okay. for example, if you type in technology will replace, the first thing that comes up always is teachers. So that's the scare people have. 
that if technology comes in, I might get impacted. But that's not true. In an environment like this, every teacher needs to learn how to use technology to teach. Mm -hmm. So that's the first big thing that the industry is doing across is many industry people have tied up with universities to help them teach their teachers how they can leverage technology to teach. Okay. Because when you think of the new skills that are there, many teachers don't have them today. It's just reality, right? So how will we get them to teach things if they are not used to using all the training that is available in the world? And all the tools which are there at hand. All the tools. The second thing that is happening, if you take the industry as a whole, one of the big insights we have had is that the price of content is going to zero. Mm -hmm. Just like people have joked in the past that the price of telecom at one level is going down, down, down per unit. The reality is each one of us is creating content and training today at some level, right? All of us are creating videos, blogs, articles, etc. Mm -hmm. So much content is coming for free. So companies have realized the issue is not, can I create new content? So if we sit okay. back in India, we have a language challenge because we have to create content in many languages. But if mm -hmm. you take one or two of the global languages, there is enough material out there for somebody to learn. The challenge is curation to prevent confusion, to reduce mm -hmm. the uncertainty of what should I learn. Okay. So the second thing that industry has done massively, certainly the IT industry, and I think many others are doing it now, is building platforms or buying platforms that allow you to curate content. Okay. So you are able to then organize that content by technology. So artificial intelligence, 3D printing, virtual reality, etc. So all your employees can do that. They can get badges. They can do continuous learning. Then you start putting foundation programs in place. Mm -hmm. so if you go back to the old model of training someone for a job role, that is now changing very quickly to saying I will change, train people for competencies. Okay. A set of competencies make up a job role. Okay. So if you train just on a small competency, it's faster, it's cheaper. The person can get to work on that very quickly. When we think okay. about upskill, they can get certified. Then the next project comes along, they learn some more. Because okay. the issue is if you train someone just on one job and it takes like six months, nine months, you don't know what has changed in that time. Mm -hmm. And after that, that person is struggling as well again. Yeah. So that's right. the other thing the industry is doing is very rapid training cycles versus one long training cycle. And that is needed as well because all of us know technology develops very fast and it changes uh, tech every uh, you know a few uh, days as well, if not weeks, because new things do come up. It, it is being developed. Let me bring in Dr. Pandit there. Dr. Pandit, uh, uh, Mr. Agarwal, uh, you know, pointed out how curation is being taken care of. You spoke about customization. That's really, really important. So in terms of policy, if you look at there, or in terms of the kind of work which is being done by the industry, and that has been, that can be amalgamated with the work done by the government or the policy think tanks as well. How can the customization part be taken care of and something more as well? See, uh, for customization, uh, one has to think about uh, building, uh, understanding the local need mm -hmm. for customer, for in-house service provider and the uh, front-end people who are going to build the solution for any organization. Okay. So that's why the UX designer, which I have said in my previous point, is going to important. It is going to create the job for the People who are digitally uh, skilled, they, uh, they can very well manage the front-end need for the uh, organization. Okay. And, uh, the organization is definitely going to work on the strategy towards building the culture of uh, adapting the digital space in mm -hmm. their routine functioning. Mm -hmm. They will also be required to build up and gear up for the IT resources, IT management is also going to take a space where organizations are going to work. Okay. Definitely in their budgeting exercise, they will be in need of a digital transformation budget. Mm -hmm. It is going to part of their uh, routine, which is going to occupy the space. And the most important thing, which for emerging uh, entrepreneurs and the startup is the digital security, which is again going to build the new vertical in industry 4.0. Cyber security <laughs> aspect, obviously, Cyber is going to be really important. Data security is going to be uh, the most important uh, uh, space where 
we will be in need of a solution and uh, in uh, uh, say as uh, yesterday only government of india has uh, created one committee mm-hmm. which is going to look, look after the animation visual effect uh, the gaming gaming is how we can have a training and learning through gaming reality gaming real it interacts real time interaction with a virtual customer and mm-hmm. understanding the need and how to interact with this kind of a uh, uh, environment this is a new completely a new space okay Where digital transformation is going to get happen and mm-hmm. we will, we will be building the digital uh, uh, talent to manage this okay. this is something which is out of box and government is way ahead what is going to required for india and for the industry Okay, let me bring in Dr. Panda for a quick comment here. Dr. Panda, in terms of what both Mr. Agarwal and uh, you know uh, Dr. Uh, Pandit is pointing out, Dr. Umang uh, Unnat Pandit, uh, there needs to be a lot which needs to be done in terms of policy making as well. We will have to ensure that digital transformation is the key word here, and there will have to be separate you know policies specifically focusing on that aspect. Yeah, I can't agree. Uh... um with all of all uh, both of you uh, more on this uh, in fact this is what is more required in the msme space i'll tell you why uh, the larger companies in fact and the mncs and the large companies would obviously would get their you know talent pool uh, trained and updated and uh, they will they will uh, leverage all possible technological tools and everything that they would do Mm-hmm. and they can afford that also okay now uh, this this huge ecosystem called msme sector where you know people are working uh, like you know there are very small units working in the villages and uh, how do we how do we the first first the the first uh, challenge would, would be how to bring them to this new paradigm when mm-hmm. we can tell them that look you can't do business as usual now things are changing post covid and you have to have this kind of a thing and number one number two the challenge also would be now who pays for it now very small micro units um, would find it definitely challenging to kind of you know to adopt all these tools to invest in that mm-hmm. you know you know that, that kind of thing so there the the role of the government the role of the you know other uh, you know bigger industries Who, who can help because you know these they are sourcing their raw materials and many of the other things inputs from the smaller ones mm-hmm. so okay. perhaps so, para, so perhaps that is where i think the entire country the uh, and everybody has to come because if if we are not able to do that then uh, then things really i mean the very large 98% of 99% of the industries i mean if when what we say is industry actually are msms so okay. if we are not able to do that then perhaps you know things won't things won't uh, you know pan out as as we wanted to pan out okay so definitely all of us will have to work together be it the industry the government or the think tanks or the individuals as well thank you so much uh, dr panda out there dr unnat pandit mr amit agarwal as well for your views uh, there it is for our viewers clearly being pointed out by our panelists the buzzword or the key word right now is digital transformation and that would require several aspects to be looked into better curation better training better customization all these aspects would uh, need key focus areas to be looked into and worked upon not only by the industry but by the government as well and by the individuals also that is the way forward <laughs>